Good evening. Welcome to this week's Hope Looks Up Bible Study with Dr. Tom Haney on Tuesday, January 26, 2021. We are continuing for a third week, a series titled, Why Would God Restore Israel? This week's lesson is titled, The Surety of Israel Being Restored. We will begin with the word of prayer followed by Dr. Tom Haney. Lord, we are fortunate to have another opportunity to study your word together. May the Hope Looks Up Bible study be a blessing to all who hear it. And may your spirit be with Tom as he shares with us the truths from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Tom? Thank you, Chuck. Well, it's a pleasure to greet all of you tonight on Hope Looks Up Bible study. And I'm so glad that you are a part of our study. I once again want to thank all the people who've been a part of helping us get uh, everything in this good of a situation. Uh, Chuck getting my laptop set up, Gus getting my Zoom room set up, and Charlie making it work. Uh, I now have a 80 foot cord stretch from my kitchen to my basement, and uh, it's uh, wonderful. I also have instructions on making sure the cord is out 30 minutes after the meeting is over. So uh, we can imagine who that came from. You know, I, if we don't try to understand this difficult question, why would God restore Israel? Then I think it becomes very hard for us to really truly understand grace and salvation, forgiveness, and the restoration of the fallen. It's a wonderful miracle that God never gives up on those who belong to him. And the emphasis there is on those who belong to him. When we miss that point, we work very hard at being good and getting to heaven. And if we're not careful, we can get a little judgmental as we earn our way to heaven. So I want to ask ourselves tonight two key questions. Question number one, how much of your going to heaven in your thoughts depends on how good of a life you live? Question number two, at your best, do you live your life to please God with your good behavior? Or do you live your life to praise and worship God? Now, in answer to question number one, how much of your going to heaven in your thought depends on you, if you put down anything at all depends on you, you'll never truly understand grace, forgiveness, and salvation completely. You see, until we really understand these are tremendous gifts of God, that our own righteousness will never get us into heaven, then we, we, ne we fail to understand how compassionate and caring God is to hold on to those who belong to him. And nothing illustrates that better than Israel. In our own lives, there might be a few times that we vary off, but Israel varied off hundreds of times. So for God to love them and to restore them is just miraculous. The second question, at your best, do you live your life to please God with your good behavior? Or do you live your life to praise and worship God? If in question number two, you said, well, a little of both, but I know I have to live a good life, most of all, then I, I would say to you tonight, you may not understand grace, forgiveness, or salvation at all. It really does not depend on us. If the thief on the cross, who may have done one good thing in his entire lifetime, deserved a place in paradise with Jesus, then we can quickly say our righteousness is not what earns us a position in heaven. It is God's grace. It's his forgiveness of sin. We're going to see that very completely as we get into Jeremiah 31 tonight, a passage that was so remarkable that actually the author of Hebrews quotes it twice. It's essential for us to see how diligently and completely God explains that the children of Israel will be restored as a nation for us to understand how completely God seeks to restore each and every one of us to the way that we were created. You know how we were created? With a tremendous dependency upon our mother and God and a tremendous love for God. A child raised in a non-Christian home, taken to a child level Sunday school or church service, even at two and three, has no trouble comprehending God. They have no trouble comprehending that Jesus died on the cross. They will come home and tell their parents, well, I found out today that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. God's desire is to restore us to that position of dependency upon him and our mother or whoever is nurturing and, and giving us sustenance and a love for God. By the way, 
as we saw last week, God never really spoke of restoring the Jews. If you want to look through the Old Testament, it's not there. God always restored the Israelites, not just the people from Judah, not just the ones who were called Jews, but the Israelites, all 12 tribes. And those who stayed in the land of Israel with the Israelites. The nation today of Israel is full of Hebrew Israelites, about 7 million, and many non-Hebrew Israelites, about 5 million. Uh, and the interesting thing is God brushed back into existence the country of Israel. He restored it with broad strokes and included many people that perhaps even the Israelites may not have wanted in their newly restored country. After all, there are many Palestinians there. There are many Arabs who are not necessarily pro-Israel there. There are several that we might think, hmm, that doesn't sound uh, like the way God should have done it. Tonight will be our last of the first three studies on how the Old Testament makes promises, because there are so many, we could have just spent the whole time on this. And we want to look tonight at the key part of the Old Testament promises that talk about the surety of Israel being restored. There are a lot of definitions for the word surety, but the basic meaning is this. It's a security against loss or damage or for the fulfillment of an obligation. And that's what it is here. God promised in a pledge, a guarantee, a bond, we call them prophecies, that this would be what would happen. I will restore Israel as a nation. It took over two millennia, but it happened, just as God said it would. As I said last week, God does not lie, God does not fail, and God does not forget his people. So God put his reputation and his commitment to honesty on the line and said over and over, I'll restore Israel. I'll put them back in the land that I gave to Abraham. I will restore their country. I'll restore their language. There are about 12 things, separate pro uh, prophecies that God said, and we'll get to these and we, we get to the third part of this series, 12 prophecies that God said he would restore with Israel, and all of those have happened. But we live in a world that is never content with what the Bible says. We can say, well, the Bible says this, and they go, well, yeah, but what does science say? Or what do the experts say? And we also live in a world in which when believers interpret world events based on what the Bible says, people will say things, well, you know, I don't believe that's good enough. I just think that's kind of a not objective learning. That's sort of subjective learning. And the interesting things here is what people say. They say things like, well, I only trust science to give me the answers. Or I want to be objective. And when I study the question, just consulting the Bible is not objective. Or my favorite. Well, you can't prove the Bible by the Bible. Isn't that interesting? How do we prove the Constitution? By the Constitution, right? How do we prove what the laws of the land are? How do we have trials? How do we make judgments? By taking the laws of the land and applying them. Or mathematics. How do we work mathematics? We work mathematics by taking mathematic formulas that have already been studied and proven and use those same formulas to come up with our new answers. So it's interesting to me, our entire life is supported by proofs for what we're trying to do. But when we seek the Bible to support our life, we are seeking the greatest book as a divine book ever recorded for us to follow. But since the, much of the world does not like the conclusions of the Bible, they make exclusions to seek out other sources. This is really true when people begin to try to explain how did the Jews survive? How did Israel survive for 2,600 years? The 10 northern tribes did not even have a country. How did they survive? Well, we have a host of reasons that why Israel has been preserved for a, a 2,000 years, many of those without a country to call their own. And I want to start with some of the alternative reasons given for the Israelites having lasted and being preserved, other than the obvious one that God said it and therefore it's done. First, secular historians, even if they address the issue at all, and many of them do not, settle for the same answers we hear from secular Israelites or Jews. They say that the overwhelming persecution suffered by the Israelite people created within them an iron will to survive, and their genius as a people produced cunning and crafty methods of survival. That is a direct quote from a world historian. But all such explanations about the toughness of people seem shallow, and fall flat in the odds of uh, that any people could preserve their existence and identity in the midst of the level of suffering that the Israelites have had. Also, the fact that they dress differently, 
than all the other people in their nation, ate different foods than their neighbors. By the way, Jews never had their neighbors over for dinner because they might not follow all of the right rules. They never went to anybody else's house and ate because they might not have followed all the rules on how you prepare the silverware, how you prepare the dishes, how you prepare, you know, maybe it wasn't a kosher kitchen, you know. In other words, they really stuck out in every community they ever lived in. They had different customs than the other people, the nation where they lived, and they observed holidays around their old country and didn't observe any of the holidays around the countries where they were living. It doesn't sound to me like they were being very cunning and crafty. It sounds like the Israelites went out of their way to draw attention to themselves and to show that they were much different than the rest of the nation. I really think this only heightened persecution and the possibility of extinction. Another secular argument is with the high degree of education and literacy, which was seen in Israelite countries in the Middle Ages, Israelite communities, it enabled them to be more effective to preserve their traditions and it increased their usefulness to society. Instead of living as beggars and bums, they were able to become lawyers and doctors and bankers and bureaucrats. But once again, the charge against Israelites, even in my childhood, I remember good people saying this sort of, sort of things. Well, the Jews control Wall Street. They control all the big banks. They have all the money. You know, all the big department stores are run by Jews. They have this, they have that. What I saw was actually <clears throat> the fact that they controlled money, that they controlled commerce, and that they were the professional of the professions led them to persecution because of jealousy and envy. Mm -hmm. When the Nazis swept the Jewish people out of Poland and Germany and all the other countries, Austria countries they did, part of that reason was to have the beautiful paintings they had, the, the tremendous uh, sculptures they had, the gold and silver and precious jewels and so on that were, were in, their, uh, in their possession was hardly reasons that the race would be preserved. It made them an easy target. Another secular argument is that the high level of education and prosperity made it possible for them to be extremely mobile, enabling them to move more easily from nation to nation. They had financial resources, so they didn't pose a problem as far as a welfare problem for non-Israelite migrants. But again, I would ask, aren't those who are persecuted in one country and driven out usually the ones who find it hard to be accepted by another country because you get into political reasons, you get into treaties being made, you get into many, many other things. So I really feel the secular arguments for the preservation of the Israelites is more a listing of the uniqueness of Israelites and that uniqueness has often been the very reason for their persecution. Much better are the answers that you get from Jewish theologians and the rabbis who offer re their own reasons for the preservation of the people. For instance, one Jew, famous rabbi wrote, the supernatural element of Jewish survival must be squarely faced. In other words, if God wasn't in it, how in the world could you ever explain what has happened for 2,600 years? I like something else here. If we wish to discover the essential elements making up the unique strength of the Jewish people, we must conclude that it is not its peculiar physical or intrinsic mental characteristics, nor its language, its manners or customs. The only link unites our scattered people throughout its dispersion, regardless of time, is Torah and the mitzvot. Now, maybe mitzvot is not a word that you've heard before, but it is simply the laws that are found in the Torah. The Torah are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In the church, we've commonly called it the Pentateuch, the five books of the law, but we know that it is called the Torah in a Jewish synagogue. And when the Jewish synagogue is set up for worship, in the front of the synagogue will be the Torah. That's the only part of the Bible that will be present in the synagogue for people to read from. So their Bible consists of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All the others are called writings. So when Jesus talks about the prophets and the writings, he's talking about everything from Judges through Malachi and even perhaps some of the apocryphal books that uh, were known by the New Testament time. Th the, these were written by Moses, and they are the basis for the Jewish faith. What we need to realize is that the mitzvot, as binding as it is, was subject to a lot of interpretations. For instance, when it says not to build a fire on the Sabbath, is turning on your gas log in your fireplace starting a fire? 
is turning on your electric light, starting a fire, is turning on your oven, starting a fire. So when you began to scrutinize every one of these laws, you came up, came up with hundreds of variations for each law. So through the centuries, the Israelites have taken the laws of the mitzvah and have made them spoken laws called the halacha, the complete adherence to the spiritual heritage. Let me explain how that works. One famous rabbi said, used an illustration. He said one day a fox was walking by a, a stream of water and the fish were darting everywhere inside the, the water. So the fox stopped and he asked the fish, why are you darting around in the water? He said, oh, we're trying to escape the fishermen. And so the fox said, well, why don't you just come up here on dry land with me? And therefore you won't have to worry about the fishermen. And the fish said, aren't you supposed to be the wisest of all animals? He said, what you just told me is very foolish. He said, if we are in danger here in the water where we live, how much more so on the dry land where we're bound to die? So the rabbi explained his illustration by telling people that the Torah is to the Jewish survivor as water is to a fish, it was pointing out the fact that even if the Jews are in constant danger, if they put the Torah aside, they'll lose their identity and die out as a people. Another key element in keeping their identity, and one that I think really did work, is stressed is memory. So the Israelites on feast days already remember events in Israelite history or promises of God about the future or both. The observances of the seven Israelite feasts each year, year after year, kept their hearts in memory of God's call on their life as a nation. They were reminded of how God had come to their rescue time and again, like Psalm 78, and how he had promised that one day they would become the prime nation in the world, through whom all of God's blessings would flow to the nations of the world. The problem with all these explanations of Israelite preservation, oh, whether it's secular scholars or the Israelite Jewish rabbis, is that they only focus on the Israelites keeping their identity, not how they were to survive, and never how they were to reestablish a nation. Think of it. Seven million isolated people, well, not even that many in 1948, were somehow going to come together and form a country. We'll get to that later. But, and a country that the Bible said would happen in a day. One day it would not be a country. The next day it would be a country. The result was 2,000 years of unrelented hatred, persecution, and slaughter. So you see, as a matter of fact, the maintenance of their unique identity made them an object of hatred and an easy object for abuse. God said that would happen. Deuteronomy 4.27 says, And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number among the nations, where the Lord will drive you. Deuteronomy 28.62 is even clearer says, then after the scattering, you shall be left few in number, for as you were as stars of the heaven for multitude, because you did not obey the Lord your God. They went down into Egypt, 72 people. They came out of Egypt with 850,000 fighting men, those between the age of 35 and 55. So if you add that many women, and let's say twice that many children, you have almost 3 million people coming out of Egypt. When Israel became a nation, there was only about 8 million Jews in the entire world. So 3 million came out of Egypt and bondage. 8 million were left in 1945. So we can see that it just was truly a mere fraction of the people that survived. How did this work out? Well, historians estimate that 2,000 years ago, there were between 8 and 10 million Israelites or Jews living in the world, 14 million today. How many should there have been? In the same period of time, the population of China grew from 30 million to 1 billion. The Arab nations, which started about the same time as the Israelites, have a population today of 400 million. Based on these statistics, the Israelite Jewish population today would have naturally been around 400 to 500 million. So we come back to the question tonight. How could the Bible be so sure and certain that an Israelite nation would be preserved and that the Israelites and Jews would again have a land, the very same land that had been given to them by, to their father Abraham, and that they would prosper as a nation and get the attention of the world? Could it be as simple as God said it and therefore it happened? I think so. 
And I want to explain this answer by, first of all, tonight, in our deeper Bible study, looking at Jeremiah 31. Wonderful, wonderful passage, and one that I hope that you will take time to read in depth this week, because it speaks to the Christian every bit as much as it speaks to the preservation of the Jews. The preface to this passage is what Jeremiah had written in Jeremiah 30, 1 through 3. It's a promise of God. It's unequivocally clear. It takes the two parts of the nation that will be dispersed throughout the world, two northern tribes called Israel and Israelites, the two southern tribes called Judah or Jews, and it talks about putting them back together as one in the land of Abraham. Here's what it says. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord of God of Israel says. Write in a book all the words I've spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. By the way, this was written at a time when Judah was still a nation, but he talks about them going into captivity, which of course they quickly did. God laid out a plan where he would restore the nation to their own land. It would be a regathering of Israelites, never to be removed again from the land. And we, we, need to, we need to realize that. We need to be on the side of Israel because God is on the side of Israel. But we need to also realize whatever we do, Israel will survive because God said it will not ever be removed again. The nation of Israel will be standing when the end of the tribulation comes. It may not be the land that we see today, and it may not be preserved in a way that is remarkable like it is today, but it will stand. Since it embraces both the Israelites and the Jews, it could not have been a prophecy that was fulfilled until 1948 when Israel again became a nation. Chapter 31 begins to flesh out in detail how this was to happen. First of all, in verses 1 through 4, we see it will be a universal call to the people of Israel and Judah to return to the land. God will not limit this call in any of the judgments the world might make. It will not depend on how prosperous they were. Will it not depend on how much money they might pay the Israeli government? It will not depend on excellent reputation. It will not depend upon not being a convicted felon. It will not be dependent upon having a, uh, a good pedigree or a good education. It will be a calling, and it will be a call out to all Israelites and Jews to come back to the land of Israel. I called it last week the magnetic pull of God. It was like God just touched these people's hearts. And by the droves, by the thousands, and in the, in the, by the 40s, by the millions, they were coming into the land of Israel, and it wasn't even Israel. It was still an Arab-controlled country in which they were not welcome. And yet they were magnetized to come there, and they did. Second, in verses 5 and 6, the land will produce in abundance. The land will prosper in all ways. It will be known for its agriculture, which it is. Almost every irrigation improvement in the world, and if you have drip irrigation in your yard today or around your bushes, guess where that came from? You got it, Israel. Guess where the taking of water and, and using it in very limited ways without any loss came from? You got it, Israel. And also it would be known for its architecture, which it is. Now, it's not Dubai architecture yet, but it is pretty well schemed out architecture. And if you look at a picture of Haifa or you look at a picture of any of the modern day Israeli cities, you'll see some very unique architecture, circles and domes and beams and just a series of architectural wonders. God uses the Old Testament description of the land in Jeremiah, but the locations are the same. What was Samaria in the New Testament times is all encompassed in present day Israel. What was known as the hills of Ephraim, those are the the prosperous lands north of Jerusalem and south of uh, Haifa, those are all in the land of Egypt today. Third, God will protect and deliver them from nations even stronger than they are. These are verses 10 through 12. And that has been the history of Israel. Whether it was Syria and Egypt who fought two wars against Israel or Jordan, which fought only one, they, they all were much larger and had greater armies and would have been considered the victors had there been a war, except they weren't. There was a war and they were the losers. And even present day Iran, much more money, much larger army, much greater 
uh, strength in numbers, uh, but they hesitate to fight uh, Israel. And I would say to you, not because the United States backs Israel, but because they know Israel has nuclear weapons and would destroy their country. And unless they can get a larger band of the Arab nations going with them, Iran will never covertly, uh, overtly fight Israel. So it says that God would protect them from stronger nations than they were. Fourth, in Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17, God would restore the nation by bringing people from the lands of those who hate and oppose the Israelites and Jews. And they will find freedom and new opportunity in this restored land. They will return after sorrow. Now, the, in this verse, he talks about the sorrow of Rachel. Rachel was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. And if you know, remember, she actually died giving childbirth to Benjamin and was buried in Bethlehem by her husband, Jacob. And even though he ended up living farther north, that area became known as the area of Rachel. So Benjamin was a tribe, yes, but his mom many times was the name that they used for that area. And so it says that Rachel crying for her children. When the Babylonians took the children of Israel into captivity, they housed them at this little town of Ramah. And it was there they separated these children. You say children like who? Like Daniel, Meshach, Bendigo, like uh, any of the other ones that were a part of the Persian and the Babylonian empires. And they took them from Ramah, where there was great weeping as families were split up. And their attractive, talented, good-looking older children, yes, late adolescents, early teens, were taken to live in a far country where they thought they would never live again. Interestingly enough, when King Herod sent his troops out to the area around Bethlehem, Rachel's town of tears, they also quoted this passage. For King Herod killed all the baby boys from zero to over two, two and a half, to try to kill this Messiah king, baby king, that the wise men from the east had told him about. And it again, when Israel was born, was out of the suffering that a good thing, the nation of Israel, came. It would be impossible to eliminate the impact the Holocaust had on the civilized world when it came to making Israel a free and independent nation. The sympathies and the horror of many in Europe and the United States, seeing what the Jews had endured in World War II, showing pictures of the concentration camps, showing pictures of the furnaces and piles of ashes, showing the bodies and the, that had not been burnt yet, showing the piles of clothes, showing men and women, even with clothes on you could tell were just bones, touched the world's conscience. Mm -hmm. And when it touched the world's conscience, it led to activism that helped allow Israel to become a nation again. It was not the only reason, God was the reason. But many people that would have opposed inserting an Israelite nation into an Arab world were touched by what had happened. And the fact that many of those people left the Ukraine, where Stalin killed as many Jews as Hitler did, and left Germany and Austria and Poland, they did come out of nations where they were hated and found freedom in Israel. After all, we need to realize that Israel became a nation on the vote of the United Nations. You know how many nations have been formed by the vote of the United Nations? How about one? <laughs> you got it. Israel. That was it. That was the only one that ever did. It wasn't a war. Most nations get formed by wars. Uh, somebody's a victorious and they take that land or they rename that land or they do something else to that land. It was not by edicts of kings or emperors or rulers of some sort. That same body just created the country of Israel. One day there was no Israel. Next day, United Nations voted. And by the way, United States cast the tie vote. Harry Truman was our president. Harry Truman had a great friend in Independence, Missouri, a Jewish tailor that he admired, and he admired all the things about him. He had a sympathy towards the Jewish people. And when it came to the change in the tie vote, he brought our ambassador to the United States to his house that morning, served him breakfast, and didn't let him leave until he would agree to vote for Israel to become a nation. He went back to the United Nations, voted, and Israel became a nation. 
Now, interestingly enough, they have voted to censor Israel more than any other country in the world. <laughs> more than North Korea, more than uh, China, more than Iran, more than anybody else, because they just, uh, they just get their little knickers in a knot, you know, and have to vote against them all the time. Again, it was the voice of Rama crying out for all the people who had been lost and killed by the Nazi war machine. Five, then in verses 23 through 25, God will allow this restored nation of Israel to become a self-sufficient and exporting nation who sells the plentiful goods it raises and manufactures, and they will de be dependent on no one. This has also happened. Israel is the smallest of nations among those who trade throughout the world that is totally independent. And now that large oil beds have been found in Israel, they will not even be dependent on fossil fuel if it remains a major supplier of energy in the world. Because you have to realize for 25 years, Israel has led the world in solar exploration of energy. And the solar plants in Israel already supply well over 50% of all the energy used by the nation. Israel has led the world in solar exploration and especially in water desalting plants. Israel takes a major part of their water supply from the Mediterranean Sea. Can you imagine that? Here we are in the United States and we don't even want to we don't want to even drink water that's uh, been, uh, you know, coming out of our lakes and our ponds, and they desalt the Mediterranean and use that. Six, we find that God will establish a new covenant with his people. And verses 31, 33, chapter 31, 33 through 34, begin to spell out how this is going to work. And it's pretty ironic. This is where Christians get involved very quickly in this chapter. God will establish a new covenant with his people, and it will not be the covenant of Mount Sinai. Well, you know what that is. That's the Ten Commandments and the laws that God gave for Israel to run its country. It will be a covenant that will be done by Jesus Christ and will begin to expand until all are offered the covenant. It's the explanation of salvation that comes through grace and the forgiveness of sin. It will be the basis of those in heaven and those in the millennial kingdom. Now we need to see that that's more encompassing than just the church. We need to see that those who are saved through faith, like the faith of Abraham, will receive the same promise. And the church will receive the same promise. And once the church is raptured, those who are converted from the point of the rapture till the end of life here upon this earth will receive the same promise. The same faith of those that saved after the rapture of the church in the time of tribulation, all three groups will share in this great time of reward. It's so cool how God prophesied it will happen. Here's what he says. I'll put my law in their minds. I'll write it on their hearts. I'll be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. God wraps up this great teaching with the true explanation of grace, the true explanation of forgiveness of sin and salvation, and the true way in which we end up in the presence of God forever. Here's what he says in verse 34. I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sin no more. This great passage has such a ring of freedom to it that the author of Hebrews, who was trying to get the Jewish people to move away from the the bonds and the restrictions of the Mount Sinai covenant into the covenant of Jesus Christ, wrote it down twice, chapter 8 and chapter 11. There was the surety that God had that his people would be forever saved. Finally, then, God speaks of the totalness of this prophecy. And this is the next uh, four verses, 33 through 37. He lists six of his creations, and these six of his creations, he says, will be the way that you can guarantee that what I'm saying to you will happen. It will happen as long as the sun keeps coming up each morning. Well, I got a little hint for you. If the sun doesn't come up each morning, it ain't going to take very long until we are frozen chunks of little icebergs down here, <laughs> and our world is gone. Second of all, it will happen. It will only fail when the moon and the stars do not light up the heavens at night. Third, can you imagine what Phoenix would be like if we had 24 hours of sun per day? <laughs> oh my goodness, double our heat of last summer and you're going, 
Oh, no, I don't think uh, we're all going to melt. Third, the waves of the shores of the oceans and the seas would have to stop. There would not be a wave in any ocean. Now you say, well, isn't that possible? No, that is not possible as long as the earth circulates and moves as it does. And the floods and the what tidal uh, ocean waves are controlled by the moon. As the, as the earth rotates, the moon causes those waves to happen. So we would have to have no moon and we'd have to have the earth stop. God's telling you, this is going to happen. That's what he's saying. Don't worry about it. This is going to happen. Then he gets to some more personal things. He says, I would have to forget that I ever said Israel would become a restored nation. Fifth, the heavens would have to be measured and explored in every way before this promise could fail. We pat ourselves on back when we send a little machine that runs around on Mars and comes back into its little holding pen and, and reports and uh, sends back uh, rocks and uh, diggings. But you know what? Mars is pretty close compared to the whole rest of the universe. It is amazing. Uh, that's probably not going to happen with anytime soon. And last of all, and one which I don't think we give enough thought to. I know that uh, Jules said, you know, 80 days to the middle of the earth, but let's talk about that for a minute. The foundations of the earth would have to be explored and mapped out. No one has penetrated that level of rocky mass and that is 10 to 18 feet deep that is around the molten core of the earth. And we have no way to explore any part of that core. So God is just definitely saying, this promise is gonna happen. As long as the sun comes up, as long as the moon and stars are there, as long as there's waves in the ocean, as long as I remember I said it, as long as the heavens, the universe is not explored to an nth degree, as long as the core of the earth is not explored, uh, it's going to happen. I want us to look at what Hosea 3 says tonight, because I think that begins to explain more about salvation and grace and forgiveness. And I hope that it will help key in for you why I feel these three lessons are so essential for us as Christians. God gave the prophet Hosea a very difficult and discouraging mission to prove his prophetic point. God ordered Hosea to marry a promiscuous wife who would serve as an illustration of how God would love the Israelites or you and me through times we did not deserve to be loved and we restore the home and marriage. And Hosea was sent down to get Gomer from the area of prostitution multiple times. Each time they had a child and each time the child was named for how Israel strayed away from God and how Gomer and Hosea were the illustration of that. Chapter three summarizes this relationship with Hosea and his unfaithful wife, Gomer, but it does it to compare it to God and his unfaithful people, Israel, or to make it more personal, his unfaithful people like Pastor Tom or like you, you know, knowing what to do and not always doing it, knowing what is right and choosing the wrong. First of all, it says God seeks out his people in their sinfulness and woos them back to him. God told Hosea to go and get Gomer while she was living in adultery with another man. He told, her to go down, he told him to go down and buy her back. Now you might say, well, okay, that's kind of remarkable, but what does that mean? Well, we've all studied the story of the prodigal son, and God showed great response to the prodigal son after what? After he'd repented and come back home, right? But God tries to woo us out of the deepest areas of difficulty we ever get ourselves in. You see, God is not as concerned, he's concerned, but he's not as concerned about what we're doing as if our heart is open and ready to come back and love him and care for him and direct him. I think people miss that when they read in the Bible about David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, or they read some things about Peter's sin of blaspheming and denying Jesus and, and then denying him again. I think it's important for us to see that God never gives, sees his judgment as complete based on what we're doing. God will continue to woo us back to him as long as our heart is willing to be moved back to worship and the praise of God. So that's what God says to Hosea. Go down to that man's house where she's living and buy her back. And Hosea did. He went down and offered money for her and bought her back. That's why I said it was more prostitution than adultery. 
Second of all, God told Hosea that he was to purchase her out of this. We would probably say prostitution. And he was not to resume being a husband to her until she was ready to come and seek the forgiveness of her husband. God had Hosea tell the people that is what God would do for them. He would travel the world, pull his people back from the four corners of the world after they had realized that they needed to be back in the land of Israel. Thousands, even millions, migrated to that area long before there was a restored nation. Only then would God allow them to set up a land and control it. Third, just as Gomer would return to Hosea, so in time the Israelites would return to worshiping God and seeing David, their king. Now we know that David is not going to be reincarnated, so is the acceptance of the son of David, the prophecy that was given. The son of David shall rule over the land, meaning Jesus, the Messiah. They will be obedient and ready to serve. I see this happening in the book of Revelation. When the 144,000 Jewish Christians spread out over the entire world and went many to the Lord. The Bible speaks of many world political signs that will be a part of the final last days. Now, you'll get scriptures when this is mailed to you, but I just want to give you the eight right now. First of all, will be the reestablishment of Israel. Second of all, there will be Arab hostility towards Israel. These are all things in the Old Testament says will happen in the final end days. Third, Russia will be a menacing power to Israel, by the way, called Gog or Magog. Fourth, Asian nations capable of fielding an army of 200 million will be formed. Five, wars and rumors of wars will be happening. Six, kingdoms will fight against kingdoms. Eight, there will be a reunification of Europe. And, uh, excuse me, seven. And eight, movement towards one world economy. It's not hard to see that most of those are or will be uh, true now. But they all begin with the restoration of Israel as a nation. Isn't that interesting? Israel had to become a nation first before these things would all fall into place. In a land that God had first given to Abraham and that Abram and his seed were told by God that would live in the land. Sometimes the clarity is shocking to us who have been alive since 1950. I say that because the first two years outside of an immediate war against Israel, there wasn't too much that happened. But it's unbelievable that this small nation of Israel formed with three little triangles, by the way, no access to the Jordan River, no access to the Mediterranean Sea, no access to the to Red Sea, no, no way out of their country other than these three little land masses in the middle of the country. The three of them in total were smaller than the state of Rhode Island, which is our puniest, smallest little state, has become a world player in almost every air arena and continues to grow as people continue to migrate to the land of Israel. I close tonight with a great promise from Amos. It's Amos 8, 14 and 15. God says, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. I said this to you once before, but when I was a child and they showed us the land flowing with milk and honey, all I saw were a bunch of Bedouin tents and a bunch of little sheep running around. I never saw cities at all. Even Jerusalem looked old and haggard and tired. There, there really was not anything overly welcoming about this nation and how in the world it was a land flowing with milk and honey, I never understood. The mountains were all barren, there weren't any trees, there wasn't hardly any grass. The Bedouins farmed great, great areas because there was so little grass, they had to keep their flocks moving all the time. But that is not true anymore. They are a nation of prosperity. They are the breadbasket of Europe. They're the flower garden of Europe. They're the makers of most of the uh, food products, vegetables, and fruits for all of Europe. And he says, they shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. I'll plant them in their land, and no longer shall they pull pulled up from the land that I have given them. Prophet after prophet of the Old Testament, many of them writing either after Israel, or writing while Israel was still a nation, or many of them writing while Judah was still a country, still talked about the surety that Israel would be restored to this land. I still say the greatest reason that has happened is that God said it would, and when God says it will happen, it happens. So when God says, no one shall pluck his people out of his hands, trust that. It's going to happen. When Jesus says, behold, I go 
before you prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. Believe it. That's going to happen. When Jesus says that he will bring his people to a point where they will be in his presence and will know as he knows and will see and feel and understand as he sees and feels and understands, trust that. It will happen. God speaks it. It happens. God does not lie. God does not fail. And what God says happens. Next week, we will all through and all through February, we're going to study in depth two great passages of prophetic history that speak of why God would restore Israel. The first is Ezekiel. It's chapters 34 through 43. Most of us, the thing we know about this chapter is dry bones connected to the, oh wait, that's a foot bone connected to the ankle bone. But there's a lot more to that than just a, a few little bony uh, choruses that we all learned and sang. And I, I want us to see how God weaves this together with his end time prophecy and includes in it the church. And next week, we're going to study chapters 34 through 37. God outlines the restoration of Israel, teaches us how much he cares and loves those who belong to him. Thank you for joining us tonight on Hope Looks Up. And if you didn't get a chance to see it or you have friends that would like to see it, it's on YouTube. I just look under Hope Looks Up with Pastor Thomas Haney or Dr. Thomas Haney, and they'll be able to tap into each one of our segments of Hope Looks Up, and hopefully it will be a blessing to them as well. God bless you, and let me turn it back now over to our host, Chuck Eaton, for our close. Chuck? Thank you, Tom. Uh, the miracle of Israel, what a faith builder. I, I really am encouraged. Uh, you know, we've heard these stories, but to have them put together in such a way that we can understand how how important it is to, to know what's happening.